Hari Hari. So we have finished uh, the entire Bhagavad Gita, reading it from cover to cover, one day, one verse. And now we're back at the beginning. Um, we will not do the entire Bhagavad Gita. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do the 108 key verses of the Bhagavad Gita. And we'll do one verse a week. So this will take about two years to do all 108 verses of the Bhagavad Gita. But we're also going to take a deeper dive into each of these verses, these key verses. Whereas before, we just touched on, gave a lecture for five minutes or so on each verse to get us through the day. But here we're going to go into each of these verses, one a week, and we're going to take a deep dive into these verses and see what we can use, take from these verses to use in our everyday life. So obviously we're in chapter 1, text 1. So the question is, the topic of the day, which we'll get from this particular verse, is first to answer a question, a rhetorical question, certainly. Do you want to improve your relationship? Yes, of course we want to improve our marriage, our relationships, our professional uh, parental marital relationships, of course. We also know that to improve our relationships, there's a number of things we can do. We've read the books, we've seen the movies, we've been to the seminars and workshops, we've all gone to therapy. <laughs> so we know what needs to be done. Don't, don't, don't pretend like you don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm tired of people sending me messages, Mahavishnu, my marriage is like this, what should I do? You know what you should do. Stop it. Just stop it. You know what, we all know what needs to be done to improve, and we can improve our marriages like that. We know this, so stop messing around. <laughs> But there is a reason why, even though we know all of the things we have to be empathic, we have to be authentic in our speaking, we have to be attentive and emotional listeners, we have to be gracious and have a sense of gratitude, love, appreciation. So we know all of these attributes we must develop, we know all the skills we must have in practice. Yet, our relationships are flat, our relationships are chronically at a low perhaps toxic level, or on the other end of the spectrum, we could be at the precipice of divorce. The entire spectrum, whatever our relationship or your relationship may be, this applies. These things don't stick because of what we're going to talk about today. Our consciousness is not prepared. That's really what this is about. We know what we should be doing. We know what it takes to improve our relationship. But our consciousness is not prepared to do those things, to develop those skills, and to imbibe those attributes. Our consciousness is just not ready. It's not prepared for that. So now we come to today's verse. How do we prepare? What can we do to prepare our consciousness? Now, there's two there's a, not a split in a row, but there's another part of this which we'll talk about in another class, another lecture. But what I want to talk about to today is particularly pertaining to this verse. Chapter 1, text 1. Dhritarashra uvacha dharma kshetra kuru kshetra samaveta yuyutsavaha mamaka parnavas chayla kimakurvata sanjaya. Dhritarashra said, O Sanjaya, after my sons and the sons of Pandu, Assembled in a place of pilgrimage at Kurukshetra, desiring to fight, what did they do? So we know the setting. Pandavas, Kauravas, they're at Kurukshetra, they're going to beat each other over the head for the kingdom. is not there, he's at the palace. He's with his secretary, Sanjaya, and he asks Sanjaya, what is happening? The Vaishnavacharyas illuminate something in this verse that we do not see at first brush, or we do not recognize at first brush. And that comes in the first line. Dharma Kshetra, Kurukshetra. Kurukshetra is the place where this is happening. Dhritarashtra wants to know that in the place, or rather this place of Kurukshetra, it is Dharma Kshetra. It is a place of righteousness. It is a place of virtue. It is a place of goodness. It is dharmastan. This place of dharma is going to have an effect on dharma raj. Dharma raj is Yudhisthira. 
The Pandavas are Dharmatma. Dhritarashtra's concern is, how is Dharmasthan going to affect Dharmaraj? He's worried about this on two levels. He's concerned in that if the effect of Dharmasthan on Dharmaraj empowers Yudhishthir to be more vigorous, to be more determined to defeat the Kauravas and to uphold Dharma and to achieve victory, that's a problem for Dhritarashtra. He doesn't want that. He's worried that Dharmakshetra, the influence of Dharmakshetra, will have this empowering effect on Yudhishthir. And he wants to know, Sanjaya, is that the case? What he wants to happen is for Dharmasthan to affect Dharmaraj in that Yudhishthir, Dharmaraj, decides, oh no, this is temporary. It is essentially all the arguments Arjuna was giving. It's just a kingdom. It's temporary. It's not lasting. Give it up. Take sannyas and go to the forest. This is what Dhritarashtra is hoping. He's hoping that Dharmasthan influences Dharmaraj to renounce the kingdom. This is the question Dhritarashtra has. How is the environment affecting or is going to affect the people in the environment? in that environment, in Dharmasthan. Notice he is not asking whether or not there will be an effect. There will be an effect of Dharmasthan on Dharmaraj. The only question is, what is that effect? This is the field of epigenetics. The British um, geneticist or biologist, Nessa Carey, she is preeminent in the field of epigenetics. And she talks about this. Epigenetics is not, it was relatively new, but over this past couple decades, it's really, uh, many scientists have really made incredible discoveries in the field of epigenetics. Epigenetics is all about environment affecting outcomes. Environment affecting the expression of DNA, of genetics. So DNA or genetics is not everything they're coming to recognize. It is the environment, poverty, hunger, fear, happiness, satisfaction. All the environment where all these things are affect the biological makeup of genes and their genetic expression. But not just genetic expression, also consciousness. And we know this. You can turn on a bit of music and it'll change your thought process within two minutes. I was, <laughs> some time ago, I was um, riding with my eldest daughter. And this was sometimes several years ago. And we were in the back and we were riding together. And we both had uh, iPods back in the day when we used iPods for music. And I had an earphone and she had one. And we were comparing music. And it's very interesting. I mean, it's not something that anyone can experience this, right? I was trying to share her music and she was trying to share mine. And I select a bit of music, I press play, and within three seconds of her hearing it, she's like, ooh, dad. <laughs> right? And vice versa. Within the first three seconds of hearing what she was like, it's like, sweetie, that's not going to work for me. Or, conversely, I love it. I'm going to get that song, that bit of music, and vice versa we know that almost instantaneously our consciousness, our way of thinking, can be changed by our environment, by the music, by smells, by sights. A particular movie can completely change our thought processes. So this is not, I'm not sharing anything that is earth shattering here. However, what is important for our purposes and for this discussion is that we have to take responsibility for deliberately creating an environment that is conducive to a stable, purified, centered consciousness. Because remember, we know what we need to do to improve our relationships, but we don't choose to do it. 
because our consciousness is filled with ego, anger, dissatisfaction, clutter, all kinds of things. So that we do not take the, or do not have the courage, we do not take the time, we do not put in the endeavor to do what we know we need to do to improve our relationship with our wives and husbands. So for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to address environment because environment matters. Environment is powerful. Environment dictates. Environment influences what happens to those people in that environment. So at home, we have to make sure, and I call it the three S's. We interact with our environment through our senses. Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. That's how we interact with our environment. That's how in our environment, uh, in many ways, affects us. That's how we, we, we notice our environment. That's how we interact with our environment. That's how we are influenced by our environment. So we have to deliberately create an environment where the input from the environment through all these senses is conducive to a stable, purified consciousness that can begin to choose all of these practices, skills, and develop these attributes. That's where the, that's the first step, the first thing that has to happen is our consciousness has to be prepared. It's like the, the bed of a garden. It has to be prepared for all these skills and attributes to grow. I was, <laughs> that's the um, Marie Kondo, that Netflix show back some time ago. She talked about this very, very, she used very interesting language to talk about decluttering the home. Knowing or asking, does this thing give me joy? It's a very interesting way of describing things or clothing or articles at home. Does this bring me joy? This is addressing how to be deliberate with what we have in the home so that we are eliminating clutter. When we go to, we're all at home now, right? We have, I have my home office here since we're all working from home. When I get up in the morning, if I've left my desk cluttered from the day before, when I come to the desk, the first thing that's going to happen is our conscience, my conscience is going to be, oh my God, I don't want to do this. Right before I even begun the work day, I'm already, the moment I look at my desk, it doesn't even have to be visually in my line of sight. I can just wake up in the morning and think, oh my God, knowing what's on my desk, thinking I would rather not get involved in that, and then I procrastinate by making a thousand cups of, <laughs> of tea, right? However, if I clear my desk of clutter the night before, prepare my activities for the coming day, when I get up in the morning, I'm not at all concerned about what's happening on my desk. I'm not, there's no reason for me to procrastinate getting to work. I take my, I make my cup of chai, I come to the desk, there, the only thing on my desk is the computer that's off, a post-it note with the two things I want to have completed by the end of the day. That's it. Immediately I come to the desk ready to work. Head is clear, I know what I have to do, I'm ready to get into it, I'm ready to tuck in. But that's with everything, even if we don't see it. If our basement, our garage, the trunk of our car, the glove compartment of our car, if all these places are cluttered, things are there, we have no idea what's there, we are looking for something, we know we have something somewhere, and we have to tear through a garage, the trunk of the car to find these things, that has an effect on our consciousness. And you know this by doing this experiment. Go to your car. If this is not an issue, then try some car or a bookshelf. Try your bookshelf. Whatever it may be, take a little area and declutter it. Something like a bookshelf or the glove compartment of your car will take only a few minutes. Declutter it. If there are any books that you know you're not going to read, 
and you want to donate, put that aside at the door so when you leave you can donate it to the library. Whatever it is, declutter that space, that bookshelf. Declutter, go through all of those <laughs> parking tickets. No, if you have parking tickets, so be it. If you have parking tickets, deal with them. But go through everything in your glove compartment, declutter it and clear it out. How do you feel? You know how you feel. You immediately feel not only a sense of accomplishment, but a sense of, I was gonna say lightheadedness. <laughs> but that has connotations of a drug-induced haze. No, we have a feeling of our consciousness, our mind just feels lighter, clearer. When we get in the car, knowing that the glove compartment has been organized and cleaned. Even though we're not actively thinking about the glove compartment anymore, just getting in the car, it changes how we're now sitting in the car. So we know this, but oftentimes just going through life, the motions of day-to-day -day living, chasing kids, dealing with work, we don't take stock and we are not aware of how clutter slowly builds, 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 builds. And <laughs> there's another show, Hoarders, on Netflix. I don't know if they still have it, where the show, the people, the host, they would go into these homes where people were hoarding all kinds of things. And it's interesting, the camera would show, they open the door, the owner's standing there, and all you could see is a little narrow corridor from the door to not the kitchen, but to the stove, because the kitchen is from floor to ceiling, wall to wall, garbage, just nonsense, all kinds of things. So you see this little corridor from the door to the stove in the kitchen, to not even the bathroom, the toilet in the bathroom, because the bathroom is from floor to ceiling with nonsense. And the host picks up something and says, you know, a little bit of whatever it may be, we're gonna throw this out. And the owner, no, 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 I need that. Really? When was the last time you've seen this thing? Oh, in 1992. That is no exaggeration. Decades. These people have not seen some of the things in their home, but they've just been hoarding. And then they are adamant that they need it, that they use it, and they haven't seen it in 30 years. 30 years. And then the show, they take out all the garbage, and it's, the garbage is measured in tons. Not kilos or pounds or stone. It's measured in tons. Seven, eight, nine tons of garbage being taken out of these homes. I'm saying that, I'm mentioning that to say this, clutter can build. I'm sure none of us have that problem. If we did, we are not the persons who have this hoarding, and it's it, it's an issue. It's, it's some kind of a unfortunate, perhaps, mental or mental, mental issue. But those of us who are students of the Bhagavad Gita, I'm sure we don't have this. However, what does your glove compartment look like? What is your desk? your home office look like? What does the trunk of your car look like? These things accumulate, accumulate. Clear the clutter. Clear the clutter because it does weigh on your mind and you know it because when you clean it, your mind feels clearer. We've all experienced it. We've all, that's the, the cottage industry of spring cleaning, right? That's what spring cleaning is all about and how businesses are trying to help you clean out the clutter of your home. Once clutter has been removed, now we're going to put in that space those things that are conducive to a healthy consciousness, a healthy mind. That means sights, smells, sounds. Make sure the art in your home is not jarring, discordant, and just... <laughs> There's a, I was watching the um, uh, that sitcom. Frasier, <laughs> and Frasier is, he's, he's a psychiatrist, he's, you know, he goes to museums and he's posh and he's, you know, uh, like, he has that nature. Whereas his father is, he's a retired police officer, he's the salt of the earth, he's a baby boomer, he was in the Second World War, he's a man's man, and, <laughs> and Frasier, as his father calls Frasier, his father calls him artsy fartsy. <laughs> So, however, his father is always lamenting because he cannot buy or find a gift 
for Frasier that Frasier likes. So his father goes to a restaurant, some steakhouse somewhere, and he sees a bit of art, and he asks the owner if he can buy it. He buys that bit of art, he gift wraps it, he takes it home and gives it to Frasier. Frasier, this is a present for you. <laughs> Frasier opens up the this painting, and when you see the painting, it is, there's no other word for it. It is hideous, it is jarring, and it is, frankly, frightening. <laughs> It's this painting of a bull in stark, vivid, red, black hues. And it's, this bull's got horns. <laughs> its eyes are bulging. And Frazier calls it the epileptic bull. <laughs> I say all that to say this. As Frazier was trying to make his father feel good by putting up this epileptic bull in his home, we have to be sure that the art, the decor of our home, is aesthetically pleasing for all of us who live there. Wife, husband, children, and so on. Art and decor that is uplifting, that is calming, that is centering, is very, very important because when we are in... <laughs> forgive me. When you're arguing with your wife about whether or not there should be bananas in the fruit salad... <laughs> I'm sorry, that's an inside joke. <laughs> when you're arguing with your right wife about whether or not there should be bananas in the fruit salad, if we are in an environment that is conducive, that has always been conducive to a centered mind and consciousness, then when we get into this conflict about bananas, we are able to choose patience, empathy, love, tolerance, understanding when we engage in this conflict over bananas. But if we're living in an environment that is visually assaulting, that the smells are offending, the sounds are jarring, then when we have to argue about whether or not there should be bananas in the fruit salad, what are we going to do? We're going to be irritable. We're going to be impatient, intolerant. We are not going to be gracious. We won't want to listen. We will raise our voices. And then you're going to send the message to Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu, something's wrong with my relationship. Of course it is because our home is a freak show. <laughs> you get my point. Environment matters. Environment has an effect on the quality of our consciousness. And we need to have a clear consciousness so that we can adapt these principles. We can enact these tools, develop these skills of creating and maintaining a deep relationship of love. Be deliberate about creating that environment in your home. Be deliberate daily. Make sure the things that you have are in their proper place. I was, <laughs> my wife is wonderful at this. She's not here. She's out of the country. Um, so I, I mean, I, I'm always on dishwasher duty. Um, so to help with the dishwashing, I have a sponge, obviously, and other things. But sometimes this sponge. When it gets old and it's time for it to be changed and it's falling apart, you know, I have the sponge and I'm thinking, oh, this needs to be changed. And miraculously, the next day, there's a new sponge there. <laughs> That's the magic of having Davy. <laughs> Forgive me. There's a new sponge there. Uh, Davy's not here now. She's in, uh, she's out of the country. Uh, the other day, two days ago, the sponge was falling apart and it, <laughs> and it wasn't replacing itself. <laughs> I was waiting for the sponge to replace itself and regenerate itself and become new again. <laughs> Make the sponge new again. Sorry, forgive me. Um, and then I realized, oh, Mahavishnu, you idiot. <laughs> Go get the new sponge. So I'm looking everywhere around the sink and I, everywhere I think where there should be a sponge, there is no sponge. So sure enough, <laughs> Davy, where are the sponges? <laughs> Good Lord in heaven. Oh, I am blessed. 
And she says, the sponge, without hesitation, if you go into the kitchen closet, on the middle shelf, there's a white Tupperware. In the far corner, there's new sponges. There's the sponge. Everything should have its place. And I know this, even though I don't, I personally don't know where something may be in the home, Davy does. She knows where everything is. She has created an environment at home that is conducive to her winning all the arguments about bananas. No, forgive me. <laughs> uh, but you get my point. We have to make deliberate effort to ensure that our environment, because the environment matters, it is going to have an effect. That is what Dhritarashtra is talking about. The environment is going to have an effect. The only question is, is it going to have an effect that is beneficial for us, for our loving relationship, for our children, for our marriage? That's the only question. That the environment has an effect, that is assured. So we have to be deliberate that the sites in our home are conducive to a loving relationship, are conducive to maintaining a consciousness that supports loving relationship. Sights, sounds, smells, very, very important s sounds. When I was going to school in uh, Mayapur, in the morning they would play the Shanai, which you could hear throughout the entire community. In the evening, they would play the Shanai, the morning raga and the evening raga. Shanai is this wind instrument type thing. When they would turn on the Shanai, it would transform. Even to this day, I can be transported to those times in that frame of consciousness when the sun was rising and the Shanai is playing across the fields of Mayapur. That is an incredible environment. We can, must create that, not can, we must create similar environment in our homes using music, using smells, using sight. Whatever is at hand, deliberately create the environment that enables us to be in a state of consciousness that supports loving relationships. Then we can get to work. Then all those tips, then all those seminars, all those practices, all those attributes we need to develop, then they will stick because our consciousness is prepared ground. Environment matters. Be deliberate. Be aware of your home environment. Hari hari.